morning and welcome. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. We are so glad that you have come to join with us today as we worship the Lord together. God is a good God, isn't he? He's a great God. We're looking forward to the message that he'll have for us today, being together and worshiping in his presence. So let's all stand together and join together in singing, Holy Spirit, thou art welcome. together in prayer. Father, we just come before you and we thank you for the privilege that we have to come together to worship you and to be here today. Father, I pray that as we worship you, Lord, that your presence would be here and Father, that you would touch us. Father, I pray that you would convict us of our sin and draw us to you. I pray that we would desire to be holy as you would have us to be holy. And Father, I just pray that you would do a mighty work in our hearts today. Father, I pray for our community. I pray for those who are around us. Lord, I pray for this church that we would have an impact in our community and our world for you. Father, I pray for Friday as his compassion will be here. And I pray that we would be able to plant seeds of the gospel in those that come. And Father, I just pray that it would be a wonderful time of ministry. Father, you are a great God. You are a glorious God. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we bow before you today in humbleness. And Father, I just pray that you would do a mighty great work today. For it's in your wonderful, blessed name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Just a couple of announcements of things that are going on this week. Uh, this Friday, we have His Compassion will be here. So we're bringing a truck or two uh, with uh, food to distribute to our community. And so if you're able to help with that, we would ask that you would be here by between 815 and 830. We'll start serving probably around 9 o'clock or thereabouts. But uh, if you can help with that, that would be greatly appreciated. So that's going to be this Friday. Last month, we had 100 and it was 116 vehicles that came through so uh, we are staying pretty busy with that also next sunday morning mother's day we'll be celebrating the moms in the church and, and the ladies and so uh, the men are going to be serving breakfast next sunday morning so instead of sunday school everyone will be over in the family life center and we'll have a uh, breakfast and so everyone is invited to attend to come and be a part of that the men will be preparing the breakfast and so we're looking forward to that it'll be a great time of celebrating moms and so that's going to be next Sunday morning. Also, we have uh, the art sales coming up. That's going to be in just a couple of weeks. And so we're preparing and getting ready for that. If you can help sort, you could come and help out with that after the uh, ladies' uh, Bible study on Tuesday morning. So those are some of the events and things that are going on here within the church within the next week. If you are here with us, if you're a guest or if you have a prayer request in your bulletin, it's one of these little slips. If you would, just take a moment to uh, fill that out, and then you can drop that in the offering plates that are by the doors there as you leave. So, Paul, would you come and lead us in worship? Open my eyes that I might see. So 
sing this next song. It took a miracle.
And then it truly did take a miracle, didn't it? Yeah. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 1. We'll be camping out here in just a little bit. And as we started the series, taking a look at heresies, today we're going to be looking at Jesus Christ and asking the question, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus? It's a question that has been asked throughout the century. It's been debated. It's been looked at. And each and every generation has to deal with that question. Who is Jesus? You know, as we think about Christ, if we do not have Jesus Christ right, then we don't have Christianity right. Yeah. It fails to exist. We have to know who Jesus is and what he is. I'm going to put a statement up on the screen here, and I'd like to know if you agree or disagree with this statement. And the question here is, Jesus was the first and the greatest created being by God the Father. How many would agree with that statement? Okay? Anybody disagree? Okay? we got kind of like a mix here. We're going to take a look at that in a little bit. And um, as we look at this statement, there's one thing that, that I want to just point out real quick, is that it says here that that greatest created being by God. When we think about Jesus, Jesus is God. He is God in the flesh. He was, is, and always has been. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at. And Ligonier did a study in 2018. They asked 3,000 different evangelicals about that statement that I put up on the screen. And this is their, their conclusion about what they found. They said, strangely, while most evangelicals strongly believe in justification by faith alone, they are confused about the person of Jesus Christ. On one hand, virtually all evangelicals express support for Trinitarian doctrine. That means God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the three are one. Yet at the same time, most agree that Jesus is the first and the greatest being created by God which was a view espoused by the ancient heretic Arius. Now, Arius was one who didn't believe that Jesus was God, but that he was a lesser being or a half-God. And so that was a teaching that was coming out, a heretical teaching, and they had to deal with that. And they talked about that at the Council of Nicaea in, in uh, AD 325, and again at the Council of Constantinople in 381. These two said, this is heretical teaching. This is not right. And so they, they threw it out. But as we come back and we think about Americans, the number of American evangelicals who agree with this view has increased. From 2016, they did the same study in 2016, 71% agreed with the statement, 23% disagreed with the statement. And then today, when they did it, the most recent study they did, they found that 78% agreed with the statement, 18% disagree with that. See how easy it is? Just a little bit, a little tweak can change things in the way we see Jesus. There's another heresy that's been taught about Jesus called adoptionism, and that teaches that when Jesus Christ was baptized, you know, when Jesus was there and he was baptized by John, the Holy Spirit was there, that that's when he became a divine being, that he wasn't truly divine prior to that. But as we look to the scriptures and as we read the scriptures and we follow the word of God, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He was, is, and always will be. And the three, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the three are one. And so let's take a look at John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And it says this. John writes to us, and as you read through John, you see him focusing on the deity of Christ, who he is. And as we see here, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. When you see that there and it says Word, who is he referring to? He's referring to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was, is, always will be. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. I want to read to you just briefly 
I want to go back to the, the Baptist faith and message. This is our statement of faith. And I just want to read what it says about Jesus Christ. A Baptist faith and message is our statement of beliefs. 44,000, 47,000 different Southern Baptist churches across the land would agree with this. Christ is the eternal Son of God in his incarnation as Jesus Christ. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus perfectly revealed and did the will of God, taking upon himself human nature with its demands and necessities and identifying himself completely with mankind, yet without sin. He honored the divine law by his personal obedience, and in his substitutionary death on the cross, he made provision for the redemption of men from sin. He was raised from the dead with a glorified body and appeared to his disciples as the person who was with them before his crucifixion. He ascended into heaven and is now exalted at the right hand of God, for he is, he is the one mediator, fully God, fully man, in whose person is affected the reconciliation between God and man. He will return in power and glory to judge the world and to consummate his redemption, redemptive mission. He now dwells in all believers as the living and ever-present Lord. That's our statement of faith as to who Jesus is. He is God in the flesh born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sin, returned, went to heaven, and will one day return. That's who Jesus is. And as we look in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we see, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is eternal, everlasting, and in, while He was here on earth, He was the form of God. You see, he's not created by God. He is God. And John starts the gospel by focusing in on Jesus and his deity. You know, as I think of these words, in the beginning was the word. Think back to Genesis, Genesis 1.1. What is that verse? How does that, the Bible start out? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning. And here we have John writing, in the beginning. You see, God was with Jesus, and Jesus was God, and they were all there in the beginning. You see, the Word was God. Jesus and God are one. They are together, but not separate. And we see the passage there, that verse that says, And the Word was God. God John makes it very clear who Jesus was and is. Jesus is God in the flesh. Now, over the years, there have been some that have tried to take Jesus and say things like he was a man, that he was a sinner. There have been others that have said he wasn't truly God, that he wasn't fully God, fully man. All of these are things that if they are true, then Christianity ceases to exist. What better way to destroy Christianity than to destroy Jesus Christ? Because if you destroy Christ, then, you, then you've destroyed the Christian faith. But I want to show you another example of some things that have happened and how the teaching, how things can change. One little word can make all the difference. Go ahead and put the next uh, uh, slide up. <coughs> Go ahead and flip to the next slide. Okay. Okay, I'll give you these, uh, these uh, examples. There's one, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was a God. Now that comes from the New World Translation, which is what the Jehovah Witnesses would use. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. It says a and then a little g. But when you look at what we have in the text today, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Capital G. You can see that it, that one little word can make all the difference into who Jesus is. Because if you take it and you make it a God, it's a whole lot different than if it's God. If you make it a little g instead of a big g, when you look and you're reading through the scriptures, you see that, that when you talk about have the big g, the capital letter g, you know we're talking about God, the infinite King of kings and the Lord of lords. But if it can be minimalized, minimalized if Jesus can be minimalized, then it downgrades Christianity. 
You see, that's how heresies start. One letter, one word, one teaching can be changed, and it can change the outcome for everything. See, we have to know who Jesus is and what he has done. We have to be solid in our faith. And that's why today we want to look at this, these passages of Scripture that talks about Jesus. Take a look at 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7. John writes to us in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And the three are one. Who is the Word? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh. God became flesh. And when Jesus was here, what did he do? He proclaimed the way to heaven. He proclaimed salvation to all. He healed the sick. He healed the brokenhearted. He brought people to a right relationship with God. You see, John's writing to us here, and he's saying there's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and the three are one. Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, they are all one. There's another verse in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 13. 13. John is writing to us and he says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called, look at what it says here, the Word of God. Jesus, being described as the Word of God. Now go back into John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, when Jesus came, he was and is God in the flesh. And he proclaimed the Word, he proclaimed the message, he proclaimed the good news. He proclaimed the good news that the Messiah had come. And for everyone who received him, they received eternal life. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is God in the flesh. And there's no doubt about it when you look throughout scriptures that Jesus is God. Secondly, Jesus is the creator. John chapter 1, verse number 3. Look at this verse. It says, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. The Word, Jesus, was the creator. See, he and God, they're all one. And so he was there for creation. He created it all. Nothing was made or without him. You know, as we think about Jesus and his power, his power over the elements, he created it all. That's why when he was with his disciples and they were in the boat and he can walk on water. He created it all. He had power over these things. When he gets in the boat and, they're, and, and he's asleep during the storm, and he wakes up and he comes out, and he calms the storm by the word. He created it all. He was supreme. You see, Jesus is the creator. And he created it all, and he's in it all and through all. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. And when we take Jesus Christ out, what happens? It all begins to fall apart. It all begins to fall apart. We take a look at our human body and how well it's put together and all the components that are there. It's not by accident that it just happened. It's not by accident that everything just kind of came together and the molecules were all formed together and all of a sudden, poof, here we are. You look back in the Genesis and you see God saying that God created and formed man and he breathed life into us. We are created by him. And God, Jesus Christ, holds it all together. You've heard me talk about before about the laminin, the, the protein molecule that's in our body. It's, it's what holds us all together. It's like the building block, the foundation. When you build a house, you have to have a good foundation. If the foundation is not sound and secure, then what ends up happening to the rest of the house? It falls apart. 
But when you look at that molecule and you pull it up and you look at it in the shape of it, it's in the form of a cross. And some would say, oh, it's just by accident that that happened. It's just a random. I think God was trying to give a message that when you look at that scripture verse, you see that it says all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. It, it, everything points to Jesus. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. And we look at our own human bodies and we can see that being held true. See, Jesus Christ is a creator, the sustainer, the one that holds us all together. Scripture tells us that Jesus is the creator. He's the sustainer. And without him, everything falls apart. Just like if you take that molecule out of our bodies, the body would fall apart. It's the building block, the foundation. It's what other molecules adhere to and holds things together. Isn't that cool to stop and think about it? How God in his wonderful, his wonderful nature created us, put us together in such a way that when we look at it, we can see Jesus. All we have to do is look. So Jesus is the creator. And next in John 1, 4 through 5, we see that Jesus is the light. Take a look there in verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus is the light. When we look and we see here in these verses, we see that light always overcomes darkness. It always overcomes darkness. The world is a dark place. When we look at our world today, and we see how things are going. It seems like things are getting darker and darker and darker and darker. But yet the light always overcomes the darkness. When we proclaim his love, and when we proclaim the love of Jesus, when we proclaim the redemption, when we proclaim the message that he redeemed us from our sin, that he saved us from our sin, that he gives us new life, a person can be living in darkness and as soon as they hear the good news of the gospel message, it's like, boom, the light comes on. And all of the things that are within, the struggles that they're having, seem to fade away because now the light of the gospel, the light of Jesus has come into their life. And they are changed and made new. Jesus is the light. When we look at that word light here, it means the source of. The source of. Jesus is the source of life. And life more abundantly. He is the source. If you want to have life and life more abundantly, turn to Christ. Come to Jesus. Repent of your sin. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, come to the source. Come to Jesus. He is the source of the light and the life in our world. You know, when we think about the source. When the source of something is removed, then it ceases to exist. Think about this for a moment. Those of us that drove vehicles to church this morning, we go to the gas station and we put the gas into the gas tank. We fill up the gas tank. We drive our car. And let's say something happens and, and you know, we get that little orange light that says it's time to put gas in your car. But we think, ah, you know, I don't need to worry about that. I filled my tank up. It's good to go. And so we keep on driving. And we drive the car and we keep on going. And now the little light now, it's flashing at us. Hey, I need gas. I need gas. And we're like, ah, no, I still got another five gallons worth of gas in my car. I'm fine. I'm good. And so we keep driving. The light's flashing at us. Then all of a sudden what happens? The car goes, you know, and it quits. And you sit back and you think, oh, I guess I needed some gas. <laughs> the gas ran out. The source of what makes the vehicle work is gone. And the, and the vehicle ceases to exist or it ceases to work. You still have the car, but now you've got to get the gas. When we look at the scriptures and we see the word here, light, and it's saying the light, the light is the source. Jesus is the source. If you take out Jesus, what happens? Life ceases to exist. The light of the world is gone. But as we know, Jesus came in and he shined that light bright. And he's touching hearts and lives each and every day. And he's touched many of us here. 
And as we go out into the world, our light can shine bright and we can overcome the darkness and the things that are happening in this world. Oh, it looks bad. It looks bleak. It looks there's all kinds of bad things that are going. But Jesus is the light. And when we turn towards him, we let our light shine. We can bring a little bit of Jesus into the life of somebody we come in contact with. We can change a person's life one person at a time. You can go out and you can touch somebody that's having a bad, terrible, horrible, very bad day. And you can share the good news of the gospel with them. And it can change their life. Jesus is the light. He is the source of life. You see? And that's what it's all about. Verse 5. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth not. You know, spiritually speaking, it's a dark world. There's a battle that's going in, going on. But when Jesus came in, he brought light into a darkened world. The lights came on. You know, have you ever talked to somebody and, and they have difficulty understanding some things? Sometimes I talk with folks and I'm not always grasping quite what they're saying. And I have to stop. And it takes me a little while to figure things out. And then when it comes on, it's like, oh, okay, now I got it. The light comes on. You know, sometimes we talk with folks and we think, well, the lights come on, but nobody's home. Have you ever? Yeah. Uh, I can be that way sometimes. <laughs> Takes a little while. The light comes on. We understand it. And we get it. And we know it. When Jesus comes into our light, the light comes on. But there are some folks that, that don't understand and don't get it. And when you think about Jesus when he was here on earth, it's interesting that the people who had the prophecies of the Old Testament who knew the Messiah was going to come, refused to acknowledge that Jesus was the Messiah. They had it. They had the word. They had everything in the Old Testament. They had all the scriptures pointing towards Christ. But they refused to do it. And that's what, as John writes here, he says, you know, the light came on, the, 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 the light shined, but the darkness comprehended not. They didn't understand it. But yet to the others, to the Gentiles, they got it. They got it. Now think about the light. What is it about the light that, that makes it so revealing? Well, we think about light. Light, reveal, light will reveal deficiencies. Light will re reveal deficiencies. If there's, a, if there's something that's not right, an imperfection, light can bring it out. Light can bring it out. If there's something that you're looking at and you can't quite tell if it's if it's all there, or if there's something that's missing, or if it's not quite right, you can bring it underneath the light, and the light will reveal deficiency. You know, you think about gemstones, when they put it underneath the light, you can see any kind of deficiencies or things that might be there. That light will bring out deficiencies, and sometimes people don't like that. To the ones that had the hardened hearts, when the light shined, it brought out deficiencies. They didn't like it. When we get under as Christians, when we get under the power of the Holy Spirit, and the light begins to shine in our life, sometimes we don't like that, but yet that's what God wants, because he wants to reveal those things so they can be dealt with. The light reveals the word. The light reveals the word. Jesus is the light. He is the word. Now think about this for a moment. Have you ever tried to read the fine print of the pill bottle? I'm finding that sometimes I have to get that little pill bottle out and get that underneath some light so I can see the letters. You know, that light, it reveals the words that, that are there. We think about spiritually speaking. When Jesus came, he revealed the light. It shined into the souls and into the spirits of men and women. And it began to, real, it began to show the deficiencies. It began to show, I'm missing something. So he began to show and point these things out. And Jesus, as he was there, he is the light of the world. And it shined bright. And it revealed those things. Light gives direction. We think about light. You know, when you're driving in the car and you come to the stoplight, I heard somebody tell me once, green means go, red means stop, and yellow means go faster. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that when you come to the yellow light and you see the light's about to change? You know, how many of us speed up? Sometimes. How many slow down? It's hard to say. You know, you kind of look around, you see if there's any traffic coming the other way. You look around, are there any kind of red light cameras around? Maybe I can make it, maybe not, you know. But when we think about light, 
it gives direction. In that case, the traffic light, it gives direction. You know, you stop, you go, or caution, the light's about to change. We think about the word, we think about the light. The light gives direction. Jesus gave direction on how to live life. We think about, you read in Matthew, the first five chapters of Matthew, or when he's up and he gives the Sermon on the Mount, chapters five through eight, how to live life. His example as how to live life. The word proclaimed and gave us a new way of living life. Some people accepted it, some people rejected it. Light illuminates when you get under the light. When you think about the surgeons, when they go in and they do the surgeries, what do they do? They have these big lights that are in the room. You, know, you can't see them because you're knocked out. You have no idea what's going on. But you know, if you ever watch TV shows, and they all have the big bright lights you know, in the rooms and they shine. What are they doing? They're illuminating the area that they're working on so they can see everything. Light will illuminate and bring things out. When you get into the Word and you start reading the Word of God, what happens? The Holy Spirit, through the Word, will begin to illuminate things in your life. Will be able to bring out deficiencies in your life, but will also bring out positive things in your life. You know, you can read the scripture, and I've often said, sometimes I'm reading the scripture, and I get an, amen, Lord, that's a great verse. I like that one. I'm going to get my marker out, and I'm going to highlight that one. And then there's other times when I'm reading the verses, and I'm reading the word, and I go, oh, me, Lord, I don't like that one so much. That one hurt. Yeah. What's happening? The Holy Spirit, through the word, is revealing things with his light. And on some of those verses where it's like an oh me, I still might get that highlighter out and highlight it. Because it's something the Lord is speaking to my heart. See, the word illuminates, the light illuminates, and the light always overcomes the darkness in your life. When you get to know the word and you get to know Jesus, the light will overcome the darkness every time. Every time it does. And as we think about the light, Jesus is the light. Of the world. He came and he proclaimed life and life more abundantly to all that would accept him. We had to, you know, we look through scriptures, you see, he called people to repentance. He called people to get on their knees and say, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. How many people did he go to? And as he healed them, he would say, Go and sin no more. Your sins have been forgiven. Oh, because he brought the light of the world. To the world. Light will overcome the darkness. But as we see here in these verses, in verse 5, the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There were some that didn't get it. Some people didn't see it. It's like when you go out in the night and you flip on the switch, and if you have cockroaches in your house, they come out and they may be there. But as soon as you flip out the light, what do they do? They run for cover. And you try to get them, but they go behind their cabinets and wherever it is they find the creeks and crevices. They run for cover. Some people, they flip on the switch, they don't get it, they run for cover, they don't want to hear it. When you look at John and you read throughout them, you see the passage of the scripture, the religious leaders of the day did not want to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there may be people today, as you share the good news of the word of God, that comes to them through Jesus Christ, talking about Jesus, they may not want to hear it. But the light will overcome the darkness every single time. Every single time. God is great. Last in John chapter 1, verse number 14. We move down a little bit. We see that Jesus is fully God and fully man. He is fully God and fully man. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. And truth. When you look at that, you see, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God in the flesh. Jesus was God and is God in the flesh when He came. There is none like Him. There never has been. There never will be. He was fully God. He was fully man. He wasn't a God. He was the God. Amen. The King of kings and the Lord of lords here in the flesh. That's who Jesus is. That's who he always was and who he always will be. A couple of 
phrases here in this passage of scripture we see John 1 14 it says and the word was made flesh and what did he do he dwelt among us well you look at that passage that verse and those words and you see that means when it says dwelt among us it literally means pitch the tent or tabernacle now when you think about that and you hear that phrase pitch the tent or tabernacle you have to go back into the old testament and you look to the tabernacle when moses and the people of israel they went out of egypt and they went into the wilderness they built a tabernacle god told them how to build this tabernacle and when they built this tabernacle it was a place where god dwelt and when they would travel they would set up their camp and they would put the tabernacle in the middle of their camp and there were four sides to the tabernacle because it was a rectangular shape and on each of those sides you would have three tribes would camp and as they were in their camps as they were there they would pitch their tents towards the tabernacle so they would set their tents up toward the tabernacle so they were focusing and they were looking towards god because god dwelt in the tabernacle and so when john's writing and he says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us he's referring back to that point in time where god jesus pitched his tent he dwelt among us and we are to look towards him and when we look towards him he will change our lives he will lead us he will guide us he will take us where he wants us to go but the center point for the camp for the nation of israel was the tabernacle and so i would ask today is jesus the center point of your life is he the one have you have you are you turning your eyes toward him each and every day if you do you will experience the presence of god and as we see the second part of this verse we have seen his glory we have seen his glory the glory of god was revealed through jesus christ but going back when we think about the tabernacle when the tabernacle was finished and god inhabited the tabernacle he came and it was like smoke came and filled the whole tabernacle moses was unable to go in because of the presence of the lord the glory of god inhabited the tabernacle everyone knew that that's where god is a tabernacle we have seen his glory we think about jesus christ we have seen his glory he pitched this tabernacle he's dwelt among us we see the glory of god when we see jesus imagine what that would have been like for john and the disciples they're living with the almighty god they're seeing the glory of god in there right there in front of them remember the one time when he takes peter james and john they go up on the mountain and he's transfigured right before the crucifixion and they get a glimpse of the true glory of god he's transformed and his clothes become white you know peter gets a great idea hey let's just pitch a tent right here we'll just stay right here this is a good place to be we're in the presence of the almighty god wow and god listened and you, and you hear god say hey listen to him Listen. you see god pitched his tent jesus pitched his tent jesus christ right there and he is with us and we can see his glory through jesus christ the glory of the one and only think about that for just a moment the glory of the one and only only jesus could bring the glory of god to earth see god knew that we needed somebody like us to hear and understand the word and when we think about jesus I think about his humanity he was just like every other baby just like every other baby he did what all babies do he was just like everyone he was just like us he took on human form he gave up his glory to tell god's story he gave up the glory of heaven and he came and he became like us and he lived a sinless life he gave of himself that he died on the cross for our sin so that we might have life and life more abundantly. Amen. He gave up his glory to tell God's story when he came to earth. But everyone that was around him, everyone that was with him, got a glimpse of the eternal in Christ. See, Jesus was God in the flesh, and he was full of grace and truth. We looked there at the end of verse 14. The only begotten of the father full of grace and truth we experience god's grace 
when we come to know him and that truth in this the word truth here means reliable god is a reliable god all throughout scripture he doesn't lie he keeps his word he follows through he is reliable and as we see the message that jesus brings it was full of grace and truth and when you come to know christ as your personal lord and savior you experience the grace of god and as you read his word you can see the truth of god and it will impact your life and so i ask us today who is jesus to you who is jesus to you is he just a man is he somebody that lived a good life is he just a teacher i would i would challenge you that the scripture the word says john 1 1 in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word was god that's who jesus is no ifs ands or buts god in the flesh lived among us died on the cross for our sin the foundation of Christianity is what Christ did as he went to the cross, resurrected. And we know that one day we'll return. Don't let anybody move you away from the true Jesus Christ. Don't let anyone move you away from who Jesus is. Our culture, our world today will try to get people to believe that he was a God, that he was a good person, that he was a prophet. Why? Because if you can take away the deity of Jesus, you take away the foundation for Christianity. Christianity ceases to exist. So I would ask you today, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Is he part of your life today? If not, you can begin a new life with him today. All you have to do is ask him to forgive you of your sin. And he will do that. And you can begin a new life with him today. Are you a Christian here today? Maybe you've struggled with your faith and had some challenges, some difficulties. You could know beyond a shadow of a doubt. You could begin your relationship with him in a new and fresh way today. I don't know where you're at spiritually, but if the Lord has touched your heart in some way, in just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. We're going to open the altar up here front. I'll be here in front, in the front. If you'd like to come and pray, you're welcome to do so. I'd be more than happy to pray with you. But if God touches your heart in some way, and you feel like you've reacted to his God, you can come on down. Or even if you're right where you're at, you can pray right where you're at. But I would ask you today, who is Jesus in your life? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just come before you. I thank you for each person that is here today. And Lord, I don't know where they're at spiritually, but I know you know. Father, I pray if there's somebody here that does not know you as a personal Lord and Savior, that you would touch their hearts today and that they would come to know you personally, Lord, in a new and fresh way. I pray if there's a Christian here that's struggling with some things in their life, Lord, that you would just touch, empower, and encourage. Lord, we know that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We know that you came and died on the cross for our sin to give us life and life more abundantly. And we are thankful for that today. Lord, I thank you for each person that is here, and I pray that your spirit and your presence would be here in a very real way. For it's in your wonderful, blessed name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. If the Lord has touched your heart in some way, if you would like to come and pray, you're welcome to do so at this time. Paul, would you come and lead us? <laughs> Thank you. 
Walk in the power. Know that God is with you. Share his love and let your light shine bright. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your wonderful blessings. Thank you so much for all that you have done. Lord, we know that you came, that you are the light of the world. And Father, I just pray that you would empower each and every one of us this week to let our light shine bright so that others will see Jesus in us. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done and for all that you will do. For it's in your wonderful, blessed name I pray. Amen.